Good day, everybody. Welcome back to the channel. It's that time for another look at another typewriter. Yes, this is the Olympia Splendid 33. Stay tuned. Well, you might know if you follow this channel for a while that I've tried to downsize my collection, at least make it a little bit more sane in terms of only keeping the typewriters that I really like to use, the ones that are working pretty good that I find enjoyment using. And so when it comes to ultra portables, I have the Groma Calibri and the Royal Mercury. They're two pretty good ultra portable typewriters. But recently I've made the mistake of doing a lot of uh, reading on the Facebook typewriter groups. And there was a thread recently where people started talking about what was your favorite ultra portable typewriter. A lot of other people were kind of saying they like the splendid lines that line up in the Olympia, which is basically like the SF, which is the flat typewriter, right? And so because so many people were talking about the SF or the splendid lineup, I thought, you know, I might be interested in getting one of those keeping in mind that I used to have an SF. I liked it a lot, but it had a problem with the line spacing uh, ratchet gear was worn, and so the line would drift uh, downward toward the left side of the line. Anyways, that typewriter ended up leaving my collection, but more recently, like a week or so ago, I was mentioning to my friend Kevin about I'd be interested in looking at one of the splendid typewriters, 33, 66, or 99. Lo and behold, later that evening, that was like a week ago, uh, Sunday, Kevin rings the door about 7 p.m. with this typewriter and drops it off to me. And it turned out it was very, very dirty. Uh, one of the dirtiest typewriters I've, I've seen in a long while. And because I had the day off and the next day off, I decided let's just stay up and see if I can work on this throughout the evening. And so I got to bed about 1.15 the next morning, but not before having made considerable progress in cleaning this up, including the so-called rubber ducky treatment, which is taking the ribbon off, taking the body panels apart, off the machine and then putting it in a warm, almost hot bath of soapy water and basically operating the, the machine and everything underwater, under hot soapy water, and then uh, cleaning it out with fresh hot water or warm water to get the soap out and then immediately blowing as much of the water out as you can with compressed air gun and a hot hair dryer to dry it out as quick as possible to prevent rusting and then hitting some of the key spots that immediately need oil, like the inside of the spring motor. You should oil that because the spring steel is rust uh, prone. And also the carriage bearings and a few other spots like that. So uh, it took a lot of work and also had to do a lot of spot cleaning inside the machine. Just a lot of built up uh, grunge over the years. But got it working pretty darn good and I thought we might want to just take a quick little look at the Olympia Splendid 33. To unlock the carriage, you want to slide this lever toward the rear and then lift up the carriage return lever and now the carriage is free to move. On the left side you have the line spacing selector that goes between one, one and a half, and two line spacing along with a clutch release position where you can have infinite adjustment of your line spacing. The margin adjustment indicator is up here just behind the paper table scale, but the adjustment itself, you reach behind and push and slide the margin such as that. And on the right side, you can see the paper finger that deploys like that. It is not a telescoping paper finger. It is just a single length. On the right side of the carriage is the single carriage release lever. 
and the paper release lever behind the knob here that releases the tension on the uh, pressure rollers. So being as how this is a British keyboard Olympia, the name of the London-based distributor is on the rear plate here, which I think is very interesting. The paper bale has a paper scale on the front as well as two rubber-coated paper bale rollers that slide back and forth. And on both sides of the paper bale are these two extensions that help you lift up the paper bale. Here you can see the two scales, the front scale on the paper bale itself, the rear scale on the rear paper table. And one thing to note is that on this particular machine, the two scales are not aligned. There appears to be about a two character offset. The scale on the front paper bale is about two characters to the right of the scale on the rear. And I don't think it's due to misalignment, like the paper bale is not bent. There's no real way to realign the back paper table that I can see. It's just built that way, which I think is rather interesting and kind of puzzling. To remove the ribbon cover, you want to move the carriage a little bit to the left so the lever clears the cover. And then pull off the cover from about the middle of the sides here. And there are two studs, one here, one on the other side, that fit into uh, eyelets or grommets on the frame of the machine. So I did uh, take some of this roughly three-eighths of an inch thick felt carpet padding and I taped it to some of the body panels to help reduce the uh, sound. Um, I was using the double-sided 3M scotch tape on the rubbery side of this carpet pad underneath here. And here is the tape that I used to attach the sound insulation to the inside of the body panels. I also attached some sound insulation padding to the inside of the two side panels here. You can see looking through the gap in there, you can see this side panel right here. The ribbon reversing system uh, does not use eyelets on the end of the ribbon on these uh, Olympia machines. It uses back tension. Basically when the ribbon gets to the end, uh, it tightens up as it tries to advance and that pulls this little guide which trips the reversing system. And of course you have this other little lever here that just provides back tension on the ribbon itself so it doesn't spill out and get loose. But these are the DIN size spools that it uses. This is a good time to mention that if you are disassembling this machine to clean and service it, you're going to want to remove this screw to take off the left side panel as along with the screws on the bottom of the machine. But you want to leave this screw in place. This screw here holds this angled bracket in place, which holds the spring that does the tensioning for the shifting, the carriage shifting. Meanwhile, on the right side of the machine, you have a very similar mirror image uh, frame. You want to remove this screw to remove that side panel, but you also want to keep this screw intact because it holds, again, that same kind of bracket that holds the spring in place for the carriage lift. In this case, on the right side, there is an adjustable nut and, and screw for adjusting the tension of the carriage shifting. The Splendid 33 does not have a bichrome setting, so this is the ribbon lift here. It actually pivots from the right side, similar to an Olivetti Lettera typewriter. And there is a single bracket here for drawing lines with a pen or pencil on your paper. There's also some guidelines here on the card holder for positioning the card holder in your type for alignment purposes. This model has the gray rubber type slug rest along the the frame here and I found a lot of these typewriters to have some pretty good quality rubber. This gray rubber is the cushion for the type bars. It just seems like it's always in pretty good condition, never really super hard or sticky. At least that's been my experience. This of course is a carriage shifted machine, but I find because of the diminutive size of the carriage and the light weight, it's not really that hard to shift. And of course it has a spring on each side to help lift the uh, carriage into the shifted position, but I find it fairly easy to shift with for being a carriage shift. On the left side of the keyboard is the key for de-jamming the keys that also serves as a margin release key. So if I jam two type bars together, I can de-jam them like that. 
The Splendid series is a half character space machine, so if you press and hold the space bar down, the carriage moves one half space, and when you release it, it moves the other half space. This gives you the ability to insert a missing letter in an already typed line. Of course, this is a British keyboard, and so instead of having the dollar sign above the four, we have the pound symbol above the five. Another giveaway that it's a British keyboard is the plethora of fractions. So we have one quarter, three quarter, one third, two thirds, and one half fraction here. This machine has had a rather hard life, I would say, indicated by some of the wear on the machine. And one of the obvious things is the G keycap sits lower than the other keys. And it is something in the linkage system that's been bent, probably due to this key being banged on really hard, perhaps by a young child, we don't know for sure, but um, I've looked at it in trying to repair this and I haven't been able to find the actual linkage that's bent, but for now it's just more of a cosmetic defect. It doesn't really affect my typing that much. I really like this worn label on the front that says Made in Western Germany. I just kind of like the patina of it and I'm the kind of guy that also likes the typewriter to show the indication of its history a little bit. I'm not really concerned about repainting these machines. Uh, I like the kind of worn paint and uh, evidence that it has a history. It's been used. I think that's pretty cool. There's a patina of wear about this machine. For instance, here on the edge of the ribbon cover, there's kind of a discoloration and some scratching, obviously, from the uh, carriage return lever. But I like these signs that the machine has been used, and it kind of shows a little bit of its history. I love the evidence of that wear. And another part of that evidence is down here on the front frame to the left of the space bar. Again, a little bit of chipped paint and some of this deep yellowing of the paint right here. It's just further evidence of it having had a life of use. In a lot of ways, the design and construction reminds me of some Japanese brand portables. But I gotta say, I really like the quality of this machine. Even though it does not have a touch adjustment, the 33 does not have a touch adjustment or a bichrome setting, I love the touch on it. But in terms of comparing this ultra portable with a few other kinds of ultra portables, I'm gonna leave that up to another future video. The bottom feet on this machine may have had a different style at one point, but what it currently has are these rubber grommets, and they seem to serve pretty well as feet. To take off the body panels, you want to remove six screws on the bottom, three on each side, here, here, and here, along with these screws that hold the side panels in place on top here. Well, let's just do a, a keyboard test and see what these characters look like, shall we? Well, that's a pretty handsome typeface, I would say. It's not completely sans serif. There are some serifs on it, but they're very subdued, and I really like the lower case. It's a very elegant look to it. So in the Olympia Splendid lineup, the 33 does not have a bichrome adjustment for the ribbon, and it does not have a touch adjustment. The 66 adds both of those features, bichrome and touch. And the 99 adds some chrome trim around the body panels. So I really found the touch on this machine to be quite pleasing and it reminded me a lot of some of the brother ultra portable machines where the Charger 11 in the brother lineup doesn't have a touch adjustment either but I found its touch felt better than the Webster XL 747 that I had that was also made by brother. And so it's kind of an interesting thing that the Typewriters that don't have a touch adjustment sometimes feel better. Maybe that's just coincidence, but that's happened in two cases already in my typewriter experience. But I like the touch on this machine, and uh, I like the typeface. And I, it's a roughly 12-character per inch European metric uh, standard sizing, but that, that's a really nice size. And I should mention that... Uh, one of the things that appeals to me about having a third ultra portable in my collection is the other two ultra portables, the Groma Calibri and the Royal Mercury, both are a Pica typeface. And I really like a smaller typeface. 
personally for writing. And so that's going to be nice having this machine in my collection for that reason alone. I also like the larger size carriage return lever on this machine that is just a little handier to operate, a little longer. So besides only having a carriage release lever on the right side, the only other quirk on this machine for me as an American typist is because this is a British layout, for some reason the dash is over here to the right of the P. It's, uh, it's the lower case of the question mark. There's a dash question mark. And the underscore is a shifted six. So usually on a lot of American machines you see the underscore and the dash are on the same key. So this one, you sort of end up having to search for that dash uh, if you're touch typing, because it's not where you would expect it to be. But that's the only uh, difference or quirk about this particular keyboard layout. And other than that, it's fantastic. It's a great machine. And oh, but what about dollar signs? What if you're typing currency symbols and, you know, this has the British pound symbol, but what about the dollar sign? What do you do about that? Well, if you're trying to make a dollar sign on a British keyboard typewriter that doesn't have a dollar sign, you can try different methods here. So one idea is to use a capital S and then backspace and make a exclamation mark. By the way, this machine does not have an exclamation mark, so I have to use a uh, apostrophe and a period. Anyway, that doesn't look very good. Then you can do a capital S and a number one, which doesn't look very good. You can do a capital S and a colon, which is not all that good. You can do a capital S and a semicolon, which again, doesn't really look much like a one. But a capital S and a forward slash actually would probably be presentable. I think I like it, actually. So in my personal typewriter journey, when I became conscious of being interested in the machines and started with a Royal Mercury, actually, I think I focused a lot on ultra-portable typewriters initially because of the allure of the idea of portability, right? Being able to carry them around to different places and write with them. And then as I got more experienced with uh, typewriters, it soon became evident that the larger machines presented probably a better quality machine just intrinsically based on their design and construction. So there was always the balance between how small of a typewriter can you have that's still a pretty good quality versus how big of a typewriter can you handle in terms of being a great machine to use but also still wanting to carry it around. And that's always one of the things about medium-sized portables. You have uh, that fine little sweet spot between size and usefulness. Uh, and then I more recently discovered the larger machines. I have a couple full-size uprights, which are wonderful. Uh, they're probably the best of the manual typewriters, but certainly not portable. And of course, also I have maybe three type bar electrics. So the evolution of my typewriter experience has evolved away from ultra portables to the point where before this one dropped in my life, I only had two ultra portables left. But well, here it is, a third one, and I'm going to enjoy this one. I really like the solidity of it, the feel of it, and it, it just kind of works for me. So if you go looking around on the used market for one of these Olympia small typewriters, you might find them a little bit easier to find uh, than something like a Groma Calibri, which are fairly common in Europe with a German keyboard, but less so with a American or North American keyboard. A Splendid 33, a cute little machine made in West Germany. So do you guys have a Splendid in your collection, a 33, 66, or 99? I'd love to hear your opinions of them or any of the other similar Olympia SF models. Well, again, as always, I wish you guys the very best, and I admonish you to stay creative and have yourselves a great day. Bye-bye for now.